How many of you know what this is? <laughs> Back in 1986, uh, I could fit a whole day's worth of uh, stock trading on this. This chart shows month by month how much data my company has processed. First two months, if I put them on these, it would stack up to the top of the Freedom Tower. Coming along around 2007, a big change happened in the marketplace, and it was called Reagan MS. It was a rule that allowed, brought competition into the marketplace, but it also brought a new form of trading called high-frequency trading. And one form of this high-frequency trading um, generates a lot of fake orders, pretty much to try to fool other algorithms to doing something stupid. And that's, what a, that's where all the extra information comes from, not more trading. We're able to compress the data 20 to 1, which is allows us to do the things that we do to be able to process uh, market data um, going to back any particular day in the past, which allowed us to, uh, right after the uh, end of the flash crash, we were able to process that flash crash data and know what went on, where it took the SEC, I believe, five months and millions of dollars. Along the way, when we looked at this data, we found a lot of other interesting things, and we'll walk through these right now. In the center is a chart um, that shows the rise of these robot trading. It was, Bloomberg called it the Wall Street's most amazing chart. In the center are different news articles that we've appeared in, um, people who have covered these images. The images that you see spiraling around are unique ways that we found of displaying lots of market data in ways that people could understand because when you're processing millions of updates a second, sometimes uh, tens of thousands in a second in one stock, it's really hard to put that on a, a standard time chart. So a lot of our charts have pretty colors, which has um, kind of uh, opened us up to the art world. Trevor Paglin did a, um, a time capsule where he sent uh, 100 images that he picked up into space on Echo Star 16, and uh, we happen to be one of those images. A lot of people are not familiar with the, uh, the vast amount of data in the marketplace, even professionals. Um, when they first see it for the first time, for example, Jim Angel, who works at Wharton, or a professor at Wharton, came to my office and I handed him a stack of one second of uh, quotes in Disney. It was a paper this thick. I sacrificed a tree to make a point. And I think I did, because he was pretty, um, well, like anybody who sees it, it's pretty surprising. This information is, uh, has been covered uh, in documentaries. I've, I've spoken at uh, universities. I've been on um, uh, various uh, documentaries uh, around the world. They seem to come to our office. Uh, we've since learned that we are one of the few who are able to process this kind of market data. It's probably just because I've been doing it for a long time. At the top is a counter showing the total number of bytes that we have processed that so far up to that date and time. Now, if you're not a geek or you're not in Congress, that's in trillions. <laughs> it's a big number, and if, if each one of those was uh, not a byte but a mile, it would be 119 light years, I believe, which is, would bring us close to a pulsar. This was a movie, Ghost Exchange, uh, that recently covered uh, high-frequency trading and what's going on in the marketplace. The noise that's, uh, that's being generated from all this uh, noise in, in the system makes it very difficult for people to, to separate the wheat from the chafe and understand what the real uh, economic interest. The sound you hear, we mapped some of it to piano noises to allow other people to experience these high frequency trading algorithms. So let's just, let's just get rid of this and move on to something really simple. This was uh, what I like to call the murder of bats. This was an IPO. This is one second of trading that took the price of bats on the IPO 
from $15.75 to one one hundredth of a penny. The, uh, the gray triangles you see are offers to buy. The red dots are actual trade executions. And what's interesting about this is along the way down, it wasn't just one bad price. This is actually um, the algorithm that sold didn't hit all the bids on the way down. But what really is going on is the high frequency traders are able to place orders and cancel them faster than these orders, than other orders can actually execute against them. And this goes all the way like this down to uh, one one hundredth of a cent. Again, this is about one, we're about one second of elapsed time. This is not uh, unusual. This happens often. It usually doesn't happen to such an extent. In other words, it might happen on a 10 cents or 20 cents. Not enough that anybody really notices or says anything. But every once in a while, it happens like this. You know, BATS is a very sophisticated exchange. And their shareholders, well, this is in real time. Well, actually, it's half real time, because if we did it in real time, it would be all of a sudden. We can see it again. Ready? Oh, no. Now, if we zoom out, we'll, we can see how that impacted the rest of the market. Now, these, are, these charts are going to be really uh, packed with information. All you need to know is whenever you see uh, color, it means something unusual happened there. We're doing it by alpha. So these are all the stocks trading in the market at that point in time. And all those colored dots, they tell us that uh, BATS was having a problem with one of their systems. And that actually spilled over into Apple and other stocks that began with letters between A and BZ. This is the Facebook IPO. Facebook was trying to open up. And um, they were supposed to open at 11 o'clock. And they indicated they were having system problems. So they said, we're going to delay until 11.05. 11.05 comes along. And they said, we're still having problems with B1110. 1110 comes along. We get the same story, but now it's going to be 1130. They're giving themselves 20 minutes to open this up. So 1130 is coming along, and we're all watching eagerly. And just before, at 1129 and 52 seconds, Facebook goes off, NASDAQ goes offline for 17 seconds. <laughs> Somebody rebooted a system. We're pretty sure of that. It affected all the stocks that they trade. Uh, next up would be um, Knight Capital. Here's a case where they tested too much. They had testing software that was making sure their market making software worked. Market making software just simply uh, makes a market, and the testing software randomly buys and sells to make sure that it's working. And they didn't really have a lot of time for testing. And when they rolled it out, they accidentally included the test program in the script and went into the live system. And it did its job. <laughs> and you know, the thing about it is that they didn't know it was doing its job because it wouldn't tell anybody what it was doing. And so they were probably looking at all the profits they were racking up on the market making side. So when the NYC said, you, better sh you need to shut off, they said, no, <laughs> don't touch that. From looking at data this way, we could, we could actually see when they were trying to pull plugs at various points. Next one is, uh, t we called it Twitter fall, when uh, 12 words caused the most mayhem I've ever seen in the market to date. It was amazing to see the evaporation of liquidity all at once. And finally, uh, this shows five days. You don't have to understand. There won't be any questions. But this shows five days all stacked up. We went back in time to find out what was unique about the flash crash. And there was actually another flash crash back in September 28, um, 2008. September 29, 2008. And uh, same thing happened. The market fell apart in a very short period of time and then bounded back. And the same problem there was this flash crash was systems were simply overloaded. And now, what I'm going to show you now is I'm going to go way down into time to see actual trading in one stock on our markets. It doesn't trade at one exchange anymore. It trades at multiple exchanges, sometimes a dozen. Here, we're showing trading in one stock. The time is at the bottom. Each one of these boxes is an exchange that 
has uh, orders behind it, and they send the top of their book, their best orders, to a consolidated feed, which then uh, is, the, is where you see, quote, information. Each one of these exchanges has to be connected to the other ones. And these connections have to run flawlessly. Because if one of the exchanges is slow on updating their quote, then bad things happen. This would be normal trading here, or normal what you would normally expect to see. But every once in a while, you get this business here, where there are, are thousands and sometimes tens of thousands of price changes going on. And all of the exchanges are involved. And what this really does in the end, the negative effects of this, is that there is no way to know for sure if, whether your order got the best price or not. Because the best price here, within a second, um, can easily change significantly. And the exchanges actually don't record how they see the other markets at any given point in time. That's what the SIP was all about, and that's what Reg and MS was all about, the rule, which isn't being followed. Whenever one exchange has to process more information, because they may, may, may also be processing another symbol, it'll get behind a little bit. The best firms know about these delays. They know exactly how much each exchange can process at any given point in time, down to the microsecond. And there's a reason they know this, is because it's an advantage. It's an advantage to know the system intimately. And so really, people who are programming to trade today, they're not programming or working on anything that has to do with economics. This is really a shame. It's all about gaming the system, understanding the networking, knowing how things break. This shows more detail. Each exchange actually has to know the prices on all the other exchanges. It's the same as before. It's just kind of showing what their internal viewpoint is. And again, this internal view is not saved or stored anywhere. There's no way to go back in time and say you got the best price. This was just last week in Johnson & Johnson. It's a half a second. The price here varies uh, by about 20 cents in trading in this half a second of time. This kind of thing happens about 90,000 to 100,000 or more times a day. So it's not an unusual case. The left side shows the amount of quote traffic or, or orders in the system. The right side, over time, and the right side shows the same scale, but the number of trades. So since 19 or 2006, the dark purple all the way up to the red, we've seen a significant increase in the amount of quote traffic, this noise, but we haven't seen any increase in trading. So everybody's processing more and getting less. And what's interesting about the chart on the left, you see those gaps? That's when they increase network capacity. So when they increase network capacity, immediately filled it up. And there's a reason it immediately filled it up. In fact, that last jump there was um, on July 5th, one of the quietest trading days of the year. This is set to double in November. So people processing market data their costs are going to go up significantly. I don't think it's going to translate into more trading. Might be wrong. Sometimes it's kind of fun to watch. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, that's uh, what my company does. We process this data all the time. and. I thank you very much for your, your time and attention.